Hi, folks. Let's look at the electric potential um, near an infinite line of charge. All right, we're going to um, handle this slightly differently than what we have done with some finite charge distributions. All right, we, we have to handle this differently, and uh, and we'll get to that. So, um, the bottom line is that if we want to find delta V, we're going to call that the negative integral of E dot DL. All right. And the difference in the way that we handle this configuration and a finite charge configuration, like say just a point charge or, you know, a shell of charge or something like that, is that, you know, what are our limits of integration going to be and, and what can we set as what we call a reference potential? All right. Um, when we do a finite charge distribution, what we can do is say something like um, at R equals infinity, let's call potential zero. All right. Um, and, and we're just not able to do that in a case like this because this is an infinite line of charge and therefore is made of an infinite amount of charge. An infinite charge. Uh, there is no, if there, if there exists infinite charge, there's no place, no matter how far you get away from it, where there's zero potential. All right, so what we can't do is define the potential at some place as compared to zero, like we can for a point charge or, you know, uh, or a, a sphere of charge or, a, you know, a, a spherical shell. Um, but what we can do is just talk about if there's a place here and a place here, what's the change in potential between those two places? So the only, the only question we can really bring up here is what's the difference in potential? What's the potential difference between two locations near this line? All right. As a refresher, um, let's talk about the electric field created by this uniformly charged positive line of charge with a charge density lambda that's charge per unit length. All right. So to do that, we'll create a Gaussian surface. And our Gaussian surface is chosen in such a way that, um, well, the only surface that accounts for any flux is the lateral surface here. Um, what we have to say we know and can accept is that the field, the electric field made by this wire or stick extends infinitely far away and is uniform, at least in the plane of this board. All right. Um, so we choose our Gaussian surface such that, now these field lines also extend out of the page, toward me, into the page, in all directions, radially away from that wire or stick. Um, and at any of these places, if I look at what I call a little, um, here's a little dA vector. Well, here's an E vector. Any E and dA are parallel, all right? So if we're doing a Gauss's law thing, I'll just jam that into this space. If we're going to do a Gauss's law thing that says um, the surface integral of E dot dA is Q enclosed over epsilon naught, well, if our E's and A's are all parallel, that allows us to say that this dot product is just E dA is Q enclosed over epsilon naught. And because we've chosen a Gaussian surface that's concentric or centered on the line of charge, everywhere on our surface, on this lateral surface, E is constant. So we say this is, E can be pulled out as it is not variable. And we're integrating dA. Well, that gets real easy. The integral of dA is just A. So now we're to this place where we say E a is Q enclosed over epsilon naught. E, well, the lateral area of our Gaussian surface is the circumference times this length L. Well, Q enclosed 
is lambda times that same L. So the L's go, and we get E is uh, lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught R. And we get that um, we get that dependence of R of E on the inverse of R. And if we take a top view of this stick, right, it means that the field, while we don't see it spreading out in the plane of the board, what does happen is that the field does spread out like this in two, sorry, in two dimensions, but not in three dimensions like a point charge does. So the point charge, since it spreads out three dimensionally, has that R squared term. This is a line of charge that only spreads out two dimensionally and therefore is just inversely um, e is inversely related to R. All right. If you want, you can write this knowing that K is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. We have a 1 over 2 pi epsilon naught, so that's 2 K lambda over R. Okay, so one of those two ways is the way to go. I'm going to stick with this one. It's just a little less cumbersome to write. Okay, so there's, like I said, a refresher in terms of derivation of electric field near this infinitely long stick. All right, um, let me ditch this stuff. Okay, so, whoops. So my electric field term, uh, let's group and group. Now, when we go up here with here's my electric field well, we want to integrate E dot DL. Don't forget that negative out in front to find this potential difference as we go um, from position A to position B. And remember, since electric forces are conservative forces, um, any work done is path independent. All right, so I've drawn some just weird random path there from A to B. All right, and what we want to just be able to talk about there is that in some little bit of a step like say uh, like a long um, uh, how about this little step right here well there's a DL vector that you know looks something like that except I'm way zoomed in DL is a tiny 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 little vector alright um, now E we write here as to blah, 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 blah. That's the magnitude of E. All right, if we want vector E, well, vector E is in this magnitude pointed away from, um, away from the, the wire, away from the stick. All right, and so there's some vector, a vector R to this place that looks like that, all right? And E at this location, um, let me just move my B here, position B, sure. Um, e at this location, the electric field at this location looks like that. All right. And, well, notice that points in the direction of this vector R. All right. So if we want to make this a vector equation, we can say that vector E um, is... Well, here's the magnitude, and vector E points in the direction of vector R. All right. However, um, we don't want to. We want to say that I want to keep that magnitude. So I need to add direction without changing magnitude. And all I do there is say in the R hat direction. Okay. Um, and what is R hat? R hat is that unit vector, um, which is literally just all it's all it is is direction. There's no, it's a magnitude of one, and it just tells us a direction. Okay, so when we I'll erase some more electric field. Um, when we want to now run our integral, what we say is that delta v is negative integral of um, well, 2k lambda over r, r hat dot dl. And we're integrating 
um, from A to B. Well, maybe not yet. <clears throat> now, when we take this dot product, all right, what's the dot product of R hat and DL? Well, I'm going to take my E vector out of here and say there's an R hat vector that looks like that. All right, and what's DL dot R hat? Well, it's the magnitude of DL times the magnitude of R times the cosine of the angle between them. All right, and what that means is, well, that R dot DL is R DL cosine, let's call that phi. Well, magnitude of R is just 1, because R is a unit, sorry, magnitude of R hat is 1, so that just goes away. So DL cos theta is the component of DL in the direction of R hat. And so how, how big is that? Well, remember, little tiny, tiny, tiny in the direction of R hat. Well, that is DR. All right, so r hat dot dl is dr, All right? Little tiny, tiny in the direction of r hat. Okay, so that at least justifies why we can say now that delta v negative integral 2k lambda over r dr. All right, we've turned our vector dot product into just dr. Fair enough? Okay, <clears throat> so now the integration is not the hard part here. Um, we can pull out delta V negative 2K lambda, and we're left with um, 1 over R dr. Now, in this case, R does, R doesn't range from A to B, but R ranges from RA to RB. And notice, what we care about when we go from A to B is nothing other than how far we go in the R direction. So all we care about is not that this path takes us, you know, da -da 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 all we care about is that we go from this location to that location in the R dimension. So we only care about how far radially we go from this stick of charge. All right, so uh, delta V is negative 2K lambda. Well, the integral of 1 over R dr, as most of you know, is natural log of R. And we are integrating from RA to RB. All right, I'll employ the fact that we can get rid of our negative sign by switching our limits of integration, which says this is 2k lambda natural log RA minus natural log RB. Or we can apply um, properties of natural logs and say that this is the natural log of RA over RB. Okay, and well, uh, then we're there. And this will check out because, right, if this is a positively charged stick, you know, we know we're going to have a high potential here and a relatively lower potential when we get farther away, um, when we get farther away from the stick. All right, so um, high V. Uh, low V. So our delta V, right, as we go from here to here, we should have a negative delta V. All right, and as we put in, uh, let's see, a smaller number for A than B, right, the natural log of zero point something is negative. And that's good, all right, because we need a decrease in potential as we go that way. All right, so here is your expression for um, the change in potential between two points.
the year I charged the stick, uniformly charged, infinitely long stick. Oh, the infinitely long stick is no longer. Okay, good. Um, now, you remember me saying in the beginning that sometimes, as we can do with finite charge distributions, we can say, okay, let's take a place and say at that place I hereby define potential to be zero. And the place we do that for finite charge distributions is infinitely far away. All right, because we sometimes end up with something like V is KQ over R, right? Um, or, you know, maybe something like a KQ times a 1 over R1 and a 1 over R2. And if I call R2 infinity, um, then we can say that that part goes away and therefore the potential at infinity. So we can set these reference locations and set an actual value of zero at a certain place, and that's typically infinitely far away. What we can't do is say, let me make RB um, infinite and set that as my reference spot, because when we evaluate this expression, if RA or RB is, is, uh, is infinite, well, you can't get a zero. You, you can't get that one of, the, one of the potentials is zero. All right, so for that reason, um, we really can only talk about the difference in potential, or it's really only typically uh, um, appropriate, or you know the standard, the standard sort of line of questioning is what's not the potential near a, you know at a point, but what's the difference in potential between two points near this charge state? Okay, okay, folks, thank you.